Hi Internet, my name is Ariel. I'm a food scientist and a plant breeder by training. Welcome to another episode of Reclaiming Chocolates and Confections, a series where I attempt to make artisanal versions of mass-produced sweets and examine the confectionery science and techniques behind each one. In this episode, we'll be taking a look at Butterfingers, which is an example of a filled hard candy. By incorporating a filling into either hard candy or caramelized sugar, a confectioner can create a product that has contrasting flavors and textures. So confectioners incorporate fillings into hard candy using several methods. The most simple method is to wrap a blanket of hard candy around a filling while the hard candy is in a plastic state, forming a single filled log. The confectioner then stretches this filled cylinder into a long rope of the desired diameter and cuts this rope into sticks or pillows. The resulting confection is a single tube of filling within a sugar exterior. A more complicated method of incorporating fillings into hard candy is the lamination method, which is analogous to the lamination technique used to make puff pastry. A filled candy that's made using this method has many alternating thin layers of filling and sugar, similar to how puff pastry has many alternating layers of butter and dough. Butterfingers is an example of a filled hard candy that's made by using the lamination technique, where the filling is composed primarily of ground peanuts. To perform the lamination technique, you first encase a block of filling inside hard candy or caramelized sugar. With the filling inside, you roll the sugar mass out into a rectangle using a rolling pin, then fold the mass onto itself. You repeat the rolling and folding process several times, creating distinct layers of sugar, alternating with layers of filling. These alternating layers impart a delicate, flaky texture to the finished product. You can apply the lamination technique using various fillings. However, when selecting a filling, it's important to select one that has low water content, since hard candy and caramelized sugar are highly hygroscopic and will absorb moisture from the filling. Just like with laminating dough, this method of laminating candy is highly labor intensive and highly temperature sensitive as well. During the rolling and folding process, the candy must be rewarmed repeatedly to keep it in a plastic, malleable state. Sugar that's too cold will be too hard and crack upon rolling, and sugar that is too warm or soft will tear. Okay, so now that you have a better understanding of filled hard candies and the general technique behind laminated candy, let's move on to making artisanal butterfingers. The recipe I'm using in this video is adapted from this book, Chocolates and Confections by Peter P. Grueling. This recipe encases the peanut filling in a caramelized sugar rather than a hard candy. The ingredient amounts are listed below in the description box. We're first going to prepare the block of filling. To make the filling, place the peanuts, confectioner sugar, and honey in a food processor. Grind until the mixture forms into a stiff, malleable dough. Do not overgrind the mixture because the filling must have a stiff, dough-like consistency, particularly when it's hot, or it won't laminate properly with the caramel. Grueling states in the recipe that you can make the filling using a mixture of peanut butter and glucose syrup. However, in my experience, the resulting mixture is too thin and runny for lamination. If you get a single hole or rip in the caramel layer, all of that filling will ooze out. Next, form the peanut mixture into a square, approximately 18.5 centimeters in length and 18.5 centimeters in width on parchment paper. The resulting square block will have a thickness of approximately one centimeter. Leave the filling at room temperature while you prepare the caramel. To make the caramel that will encase the filling, we're going to caramelize sucrose using the dry method. Place the sucrose in a heavy bottom pot and work the lemon juice into the sucrose. Place the pot on medium high heat and stir the sugar constantly to ensure that the sugar heats and melts evenly. Continue stirring the sugar over medium high heat until it completely melts and reaches a medium amber color. The resulting caramel must be free from sugar crystals or lumps of sugar. Remove the pot from the heat and immediately incorporate the glucose syrup. Now carefully pour the caramel into a rectangle measuring approximately 42 centimeters long and 22.5 centimeters wide on a baking sheet lined with a silicone baking mat. This part can be challenging, so here are some tips. On a piece of parchment paper, draw a rectangle that measures 42 centimeters in length and 22.5 centimeters in width. Place the parchment paper on a baking sheet, then place a silicone mat on top of the parchment paper. You should be able to see the rectangle outlined through the silicone mat, so use this outline as a guide when pouring the caramel onto the mat. Okay, so before we move on to the lamination steps, I want to pause to highlight a few of the science concepts that we used in the previous steps. Let's first talk about the lemon juice that we added into the sucrose before caramelizing the sugar. Caramelization is the browning reaction that occurs when reducing sugars are heated. 
Sucrose is not a reducing sugar, so in order for caramelization to occur, we first need to break down or invert a portion of the sucrose into its two constituent monosaccharides, which are glucose and fructose, which are two reducing sugars. There are a number of ways to invert sucrose into glucose and fructose, including the use of heat, acid, and as we saw in the Cadbury cream eggs video, enzymatically using invertase. You can invert sucrose simply by applying heat at neutral pH, but normally an acid is added at the beginning of the heating process to promote sucrose inversion and caramelization, which is why we worked a small amount of lemon juice into our sucrose before starting the cooking process. The second concept I want to highlight is the use of the dry method to caramelize sugar. So there are two standard ways of caramelizing sugar, the wet method and the dry method. When you caramelize sugar using the wet method, you first dissolve the sugar in water so that it's no longer in its crystalline form. You then heat the sugar solution to at least 170 degrees Celsius, 338 Fahrenheit to evaporate all of the added water and to turn the sugar brown. As you increase the temperature of the sugar solution, you're evaporating more and more water, creating a highly supersaturated sugar solution. Since there are many sugar molecules dissolved in only a small volume of water, there is a real risk of the sugar crystallizing or precipitating out of solution, which is why people tell you to avoid mixing or agitating the solution as it boils, since agitation promotes crystallization. Contrast this to caramelizing sugar using the dry method. When caramelizing sugar using the dry method, there is no addition of water. In other words, you do not dissolve the sugar in water. You heat the crystalline sugar until it melts and turns brown, and constant stirring is required to heat and melt the sugar evenly. You don't have to worry about crystallizing the sugar because the sugar is already in its crystalline form. In the context of caramelizing sugar, both methods have advantages and disadvantages. In this video, I showcase the dry method because it's a much faster way of caramelizing sugar since I don't have to spend any time evaporating added water. Note that when cooking sugar using the wet method, you have the option to stop at any of the cooking stages that comes before the caramel stage. You, however, do not have this option when cooking sugar using the dry method. The only possible outcome of the dry method is caramelized sugar since no water is added. Okay, now that we've covered these concepts, let's move back to the recipe. We've prepared both the filling and the caramel so we can move on to lamination. Remember that the lamination process is highly temperature sensitive. Before starting, make sure that the caramel has a firm but plastic consistency. If the caramel is too soft, allow it to firm slightly. If the caramel is too hard, place it in a 200 degree Fahrenheit oven until the caramel has softened but not liquefied, about five to 10 minutes. The filling and caramel should both have a similarly malleable consistency. Place the square filling onto one end of the caramel, leaving a border approximately two centimeters wide at each of the three edges of the caramel. Using the silicone mat to assist you, fold the caramel over the filling to enclose the filling. Carefully peel the mat off the caramel and seal the three edges of the caramel to completely encase the filling. Ensure that you thoroughly seal the edges to prevent the filling from leaking out during the lamination process. Roll the slab into a rectangle, then perform a letter fold as you would if making puff pastry. Repeat the rolling and folding process four more times, rewarming the candy if needed. Keep in mind that it's best to rewarm the filled slab when it's rolled out thin so that it warms quickly and evenly. If the caramel tears, proceed with the lamination. The filling will not ooze out if made correctly. After the fifth letter fold, roll out the slab such that it has a thickness of approximately 1.27 centimeters or 0.5 inches. Using a serrated knife in a sawing motion, cut the laminated candy into pieces measuring approximately 0.75 inches wide and 3 inches long. Keep the candy moderately warm while cutting. If the candy is too hot when it's cut, the pieces will have rounded edges rather than square straight corners and sides. If the candy is too cold when it's cut, the candy will shard along the layers of lamination. Allow the candy to completely cool before dipping the pieces in tempered dark chocolate. Refer to my Three Musketeers video for instructions on one dipping method. Remember that sugar is hygroscopic. The chocolate coating prevents the sugar from absorbing moisture from the air. Before the chocolate sets, use your dipping fork to make a diagonal pattern on the chocolate surface of each piece if desired. Allow the chocolate to completely crystallize before handling. And since this is laminated candy, it would be a missed opportunity if I didn't shape some of the filling into mini croissants. I call these croissant croquant. 
To make these croissant croquants, roll the laminated candy to a thickness of about three millimeters, then using a serrated knife, portion the candy into isosceles triangles, each with a base measuring two centimeters and a height measuring 6.5 centimeters. Carefully roll the sheet of candy onto itself, starting from the base, as you would when shaping croissants. Okay, so there you have it, artisanal butterfingers. And I really want to showcase the texture of this laminated candy, so please enjoy the following footage. So there's a lot of information in this video. I hope it'll serve as a useful resource for confectionery enthusiasts and anyone who's interested in making this at home. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something new. And if you did, please like and subscribe. Anyway, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below or find me on Instagram. Okay, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.